without any further delay, I welcome the first affirmative speaker to open the debate. Good luck to both teams. Speaker, to the extent we deal with the overconfidence of men, specifically of male debaters, we win this debate. Two things in this speech. Firstly, on the effects of um, this self-deception on the individual, and then secondly, on effects on the society. Before this, just briefly, some stuff on the counterfactual. We believe the current world is one where you are able to lie to yourself, and you are able to functionally believe this lie, even if it is to some extent, or to like a much larger extent. We think it exists on a broad spectrum, but we think there is harm in this, no matter what. We think the alternative world is one where you are able to have rational and reasonable thoughts on yourself, the way that you perceive yourself, the way that you perceive other people that are viewing you, and your interactions with society is based purely on fact that it's evenly weighted as to how it actually affects you and your, the way you sit, are positioned in society. So firstly, onto effects on the individual. So what do we think this um, currently looks like? We think there's like a lot of just like unrealistic self-talk that exists. We think this goes in two ways, right? Firstly, there's the way of like underestimating yourself, really talking yourself down, telling yourself you are a lot less than what you think you are. But then we think there's also even much, or also just as much harm when it goes the other way in convincing yourself you are like a lot better than you think you are. You're like better than everyone. We think these exist on like both spectrums, like to like a pretty solid extent on both sides. We think that it's much better when you're able to introspect on yourself in an accurate and rational way. You're able to understand the esteem in which you hold yourself and others it hold you in is based on true fact, right? So I'm going to break this down into the two ways that we do this. So firstly, on, to neg on negative self-deception and then secondly, on positive self-deception. So with negative self-deception, as I alluded to, we think this is like really just like downplaying who you are as a person, downplaying your achievements, telling yourself you're like not worth anything, like really focusing on the flaws in yourself too. Like, so a balance of like bringing stuff down good stuff, but also like create, like putting way too much emphasis on the things that are bad, that probably do not even like have that much impact realistically. We think that it's like really easy as well to like really keep bring, like bringing this down and spiraling to a really irrational level. Because once you start telling yourself that narrative, it is really to buy, easy to buy into it every time something just like fits that narrative vaguely. If you tell yourself that you are stupid, the one, anytime you mess something up, you're going to believe that narrative, you're going to continue to spiral, you're going to continue to undermine ourselves. Our world is one where you're able to, um, where you're, you're able to like realistically like view your, your failures and give like actual worth to your achievements, right? And we think this is means that you're able to like more holistically view who you are as a person, holistically view your achievements, holistically view your flaws and realize that they are not what makes you up. We think there's a few key benefits here, three of them that I have. So firstly, we think that like it means that we massive benefits to your mental health and that you're like not super depressed because you think you're like useless as a person. You're not anxious about the fact that like, oh my God, if I keep losing all my things because I'm stupid with ADHD, maybe that, maybe that means I'm like useless as a person. We think we take away a lot of that. You're able to like more holistically focus on yourself. It is easier to focus on the good things about yourself when you don't have all these bad things constantly weighing you down. That means you are able to focus on yourself in a way that you're able to feel a lot more positive things about yourself to the extent that like mental health will still exist. It is a lot easier to buy into the narrative that your mental illness will tell you. You are able to fight that in a much more like um, solid way. Secondly, we think that like um, it would stop this, um, this harm of undermining like the achievements that you uh, and the ways in which you exceed in life. We think that like it, this is something that shatters your self confidence when you don't when we don't have this. You are able to like maintain some sort of self confidence. You're better able to self actualize. Thirdly, we think that like leading on from this, you are better able to like reach your full potential in life in that you are going to, instead of like believing that you're not going to be able to do all these things that you want to do, you're actually going to think, hey, maybe I'll mess up, maybe I won't. And like you're able to weigh that up rationally, you're going to be able to do the things you want to do, do the things that you should be able to do, and you're going to be able to achieve the full extent of what you want to be. But now, how does this go in the other way? And when you're trying to like positively self-deception, we think this is like where you create like kind of an overinflated expectation of yourself, right? We think the reason for harm is not that there's like unrealistic external standards. We think, we agree that that exists in both worlds, right? But it is when you like tell yourself that that is the narrative, when you buy into that and then your expectation is not met because it is too unrealistic, that is where the harm accrues. This is when you like tell yourself that like, oh my God, I'm so smart. This is like the one key aspect of my personality because I am good at science and stuff like that, then you mess up a test and you come spiraling down because you cannot meet it. That is when you're able to criticize yourself because of these things. We think that it like puts like overinflated worth on that. And it is, and not only is the hum of the, of the um, come, come down, it is also the feeling of like oscillation, right? Because you're like, you'll try and like talk yourself back up again. When somebody calls you ugly after you've been like talk, talk, telling yourself affirmations in the mirror, you're going to go back to telling yourself those affirmations. You'll make yourself feel better for a while, but then you'll come crashing down again. That emotional instability 
It's a massive harm. We believe that like in our world where you're not kind of like buying into this kind of like, yes, I'm a girl boss. I'm going to tell myself in the mirror every morning. You're much like less putting a lot less pressure on yourself to meet these expectations. You're able to have like more realistic goals in life. And that means you're able to a like better achieve, like, feel a sense of achievement which we think is something really good in and of itself and feeling good about yourself but secondly you're not going to like have like unrealistic expectations of what you should be you can be a lot more of a realistic version of yourself but now secondly onto the effects of society so under the status quo right we think that people the way that people perceive their interactions with society is focuses a lot more on the individual than the systemic structures that you function within right this is like the perception of like what you personally achieve and like experience rather than like how this interacts with like everyone else in the world and like the like what the like scale on which you sit in the world this is like when you think oh when people say either rich or oh, like that must be me because i have a holiday house in this in the mountains or something like that not because you own a but really they mean like a billion dollars we think this is like the kind of narratives that people buy into our world is one where you like are able to look at yourself like more clearly in comparison to like the full extent of like the extremes that exist in our world and kind of like realize just like essentially like the kind of like mediocrity where like the vast majority of people fall into and you're more able to buy into like the classes and groups that you fall into this means that you're able to mobilize for social movements that actually benefit you you are able to stand behind those and get like better standing for your for yourself and like the group that you are part of there's three key there's three clear ones examples that we're going to go into this may well flesh this out more so firstly on class again as i said people think that like they're all wealthy just because like oh we go to hawaii like once a year something like that that is like a really absurd perception it stops these people who are still being abused by their employers who are still like making like less money than they should because it's going to like some like evil billionaire corporation guy at the top they are like like so convinced that they should be against all these people who realistically they should be siding with that they should benefit that they would get along better with that, uh, that if they like realize the extent to which like they were the same as the people who were realistically the same and we think that like that's a better sense of class consciousness consciousness we are better able to like work towards things like kind of like um with um equality um like to work against things like ex exploitation of workers we're able to get like mobilized like a lot of the middle classes support the causes that they are a lot closer to than like supporting like some scummy billionaire sending a penis rocket to space secondly on how this like supports feminism we think that like women who like aren't willing to call themselves feminists aren't like able to like perceive of their place in the patriarchy right like either from like overestimating like the how much the patriarchy affects them like oh because i'm a woman i'm never going to get this job or it's like oh i'm a woman yet i got this job despite that you are able to like realize hey there's like nuance in these situations you're better able to engage with the course and like help with things such as the wage gap you're better able to stand up to men who talk over you and realize that that is a harm thirdly on race if you're able to like better perceive the discrimination you experience and like the scale of that and say and like get a lot more solidarity as well we think this is especially the case in like asian groups who are like because they are like the um they're like the token minority that means that you are going to be at that like oh i don't experience discrimination because it's like not the extent i see it you're able to better see hey i experienced some discrimination maybe i should mobilize with the other racial minority groups stand with blm be able to realize that like this is something that affects me but i also should then stand with the other people because i realize that it expands it exists on an evil level for these reasons we are so proud to propose I'd like to thank the first affirmative speaker for that speech and now welcome the first negative speaker to open the negative team's case. Self-deception is pivotal in benefiting people's mental health and benefiting social justice as a whole. That's the fundamental art here. The fact is that mental health, especially for those most vulnerable, relies on the ability to deceive oneself. The affirmative team positions uh, a world without self-deception as one that is perfectly rational. That rationality is um, going to lead to logical and beneficial outcomes. However, what they fail to take into account that this is not perfect rationality, it is rationality of an individual. Rationality of an individual is not perfect. It's shaped by the media, it's shaped by friends, it's shaped by external environmental forces. It is not purely logical. It is not purely um, derived from the ability to perceive everything. You don't instantly get infinite knowledge on your surroundings and everything around you and yourself. The fact is, is that because of this, you can still um, suffer from uh, failing to self, uh, be able to deceive oneself. They talk about both negative self-deception and positive self-deception. However, however, both of these and the impacts that uh, they categorize, the impacts such as 
being able to uh, driving yourself um, into a more depressed state because you think you can't do anything are founded fundamentally on deception. They are issues that don't actually um, they are issues based that, that are derived from something that isn't actually true. And because of that, we can address them without removing the concept of self-deception. Therapists do address them. Therapists do address your lack of confidence or they do address narcissism. But these things can be addressed in the current situation. In comparison, let's remove self-deception. Sure, these people who can be addressed in um, our world currently do suffer. Uh, uh, do suffer a little bit more maybe, but, and now every single person who has ever been in a situation where their environment around them is deteriorating their um, mental stability, a situation where because of the, because of their environment, such as in a developing state where you are impoverished, unable to, or in a war torn country, a situation where you individually cannot act, but you need external action or, um, uh, societal action from other people, something you can't change, because of this situation, you suffer. You feel hopelessness. You feel that life is hopeless and awful because you can't do anything to change your life. This isn't a small minority of people. This is a massive amount of people who suffer under totalitarianism, who suffer under uh, unfair structures which they can't overturn themselves, who suffer from wars not of their own making. These people. Uh, in our are at least offered the ability to um, give themselves some emotional bias, give themselves some happiness, convince themselves that things can get better or that things are not as bad as they seem. Things that are not rational for the environment they're in, but things that still offer them a tangible benefit. In, in their side of the world, these people not only suffer mentally, their mental stability breaks. If you live in a situation that you feel is totally hopeless from a rational perspective, you will not do you will not do basic things. You won't work because what is the point of it all? You'll feel suicidal. You'll feel uh, you won't want to have children, which can be a source of happiness in these environments, despite the irrationality of um, pursuing children in these situations. Your hopelessness increases drastically. These are situations we can't address through therapy. If we remove self-deception, these are situations that can only be addressed through such large monumental societal change, which fails, uh, and I'll talk about that later on in my argument. Um, these are situations that fundamentally cannot be averted, and these people suffer a much larger amount than those who deceive themselves a bit to be depressed or deceive themselves into narcissism. On, not only that, people who have already had trauma or mental health issues are shaped by the rationality of their environment. What is that rationality? This is people who watch the media where an individual who suffers never gets over their suffering. An individual who suffers a traumatic crime or a family loss is remembering 20 years from now and still not able to get over it. This is the media environment that plays up loss and plays up tragedy so often that people feel they are trapped. These people no longer have the ability to have that irrational self-deception that allows them to move on from grief. No, they no longer have that ability that, to irrationally self-deceive themselves into thinking things will get better. You can't think um, off, just based off your pure environment. You can't think, oh, you know, they've, I know they've moved on to a better place because you can't know that. I, I know that I'll see them sometimes because you can't know that. You lose that comfort. That comfort is gone. And because of that lack of comfort, you now have to suffer the trauma that, is sh that the media has shaped for you, that, has shown, um, that they have shown for you uh, for every loss. Therapy is founded on the ability to both self-deceive and recognize other deceptions. It is a mix of the two. Irrational emotional responses is also fundamental to therapy. The ability to express irrational anger, the ability to rant and rave and cry even though it offers no rational benefit and is founded in self-deception of the situation or self-deception of your own condition. Therapy relies on this to benefit people. 
the benefits, the minimal benefits offered to people suffering mental health currently from removing self-deception is far outweighed, far outweighed by the suffering that is increased when you make every vulnerable person have to face reality with no comfort. Every tr person who's undergone trauma, not able to pass um, without facing reality. They have to face it. They can't deceive themselves at all. There is no line they can pass. Moving on to social justice as a whole, which could offer some solutions to this, right? We can fix these people's situations because now we're all banding together. Except people don't rationally decide to band together. Banding together for movements requires an irrational, emotional um, buy-in. People in the sp a split second moment decide that this movement is worth more to them than everything else right now and they are going to protest even though it's dangerous they are going to fight even though it's dangerous even if their personal interests don't align currently even if you're one of the lucky few who doesn't have to deal with systematic racism you can you no longer buy in to these movements because you don't deceive yourself that these move important. You rationalize it, you say, my personal interests aren't as negatively affected and it is not worth risking my life or risking my career or risking whatever benefit to fight this. This is even more um, pronounced in developing states and states are war-torn. Why intervene for your, uh, when your own interests are so tangibly affected by um, intervening? The fact is, is that in comparison, leaders and movements can now only appeal to the people who rationally identify with them, the people who rationally uh, fall in line with them. And because of that, middle ground moderates leave these movements. People who don't fully align with a certain um, uh, social justice movement leave. The feminist movement can no longer appeal to anyone but the women affected by sexism. The uh, Black Lives Matter can no longer appeal to um, anyone except black people affected by racism. You lose moderate support, you lose people who don't feel massively affected by these movements. And overall, you fail to draw them in. Because of this and so many more reasons, we are proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the first negative speaker for that speech and welcome the second affirmative speaker to continue the affirmative team's case. Panel, when a white middle class tertiary educated man gets up here and tells you that, oh, people aren't emotionally invested in activism, even when they are rationally thinking about it, they un misunderstood the way that activism works. They misunderstood why we have need for social justice in our society. They misunderstood a feminism. They misunderstood needs of individuals. For all these reasons, we have already won this debate. Let me further prove it to you with three key questions. Firstly, who gets the best amount of social justice? And under that, I'm going to answer a question, how do we best achieve, best achieve outcomes for women, which we think are, are an important stakeholder in this debate? Secondly, that's the third question of how we achieve um, outcomes for women. My other question is how do we best get the outcomes for individuals? Great. Let's get into that question about individuals first, because it's the one with the least content. Firstly, Team Neg wanted to come out here and tell you that under their side of the house, in order to deal with the hopelessness that comes with being a human being, in order to um, in order to deal with mental anguish that people face in our society, that they should just go to therapy and that helps them rationalise their situations and be happier. Doesn't that just sound like our model with a couple of extra steps and inaccessibility, right? We think that under their side of the house, that argument about when people are upset, they go to therapy. What you actually do at therapy as someone who has gone many times is you rationalise your emotions. You say, oh, I feel hopeless right now, but in the future, things are going to be okay. But under our side of the house, that rationalization is no longer paywalled. It is no longer told to people who live in lower class communities, people who suffer from racism, people who have all of these minority groups that they can't access, that type of self-reflection, that type of self-rationalization. We give that to them. That's why under our side of the house, we think this whole thing of like, go through therapy if things are feeling helpless never works because we get that not only do we get that we get that far better than they ever could right we think under this question of individual mental health they also have this thing about how when all of a sudden you are rationalizing everything you are no longer have the ability to opt 
to be an optimist to get out of your situation, right? A person who is feeling hopelessly suicidal can't trick themselves into being happy. We think that doesn't happen under their side of the house, right? We think it is a quite ridiculous claim to say people people use optimistic self-deception in order to get out of depression, right? We think it's actually quite the opposite of what happens when people try to get out of negative mental health situations, right? They don't trick themselves into being happy. They don't use self-deception. They've already used self-deception and telling them better. Under our side of the house, we change that. Under our side of the house, what we get what we get on the outside of the house is people who are able to rationalize themselves out of like out of a hopeless situation because they know it's going to get better right not a hopeless situation out of a, out of a situation they perceive as helpless because we know it's able to get better right we think that even if we they, we live in a world where people are where people suddenly discover that oh my god my situation is helpless we actually get a mass amount of that right and this leads us into our second question how do we best achieve social justice so let's look at that situation where all of a sudden people are going my situation is helpless for example let's say the like lower working classes right they say oh my god i have been tricked by capitalism into thinking that my life is great when actually it's not. We already brought up a bit of this content excellently at Bronwyn. I'm going to whip it now because it really well responds to their arguments, right? They told you that that would make people feel hopeless. What we tell you is actually it doesn't make people feel helpless because when there is a group realisation of a suffering, like kind of this class consciousness that you'll hear like lefties talk about, People make moves to make their situation better. That's what happens when a whole group of people realize they've been mistreated, right? Especially when they're able to step back and rationally go, oh my God, I've been mistreated. Now, under this point of social justice, they also wanted to tell you that people would step back so far away, they would lose all emotional investment in their social justice, right? We don't think that's true. Why isn't that true? Because even when you're able to look at something rationally, you're still able to feel emotional about it, right? Personally, I can look back and say, as a woman, I have been discriminated against. That is a rational thought to have. That doesn't mean that I'm not emotionally invested in the oppression of women, right? It makes me upset. It makes me angry. And it's the same for all people across the world, right? That's not an individual example. When you are, when you can step back and look at something rationally, you're probably going to be even more emotionally invested in it. Why is this so important? It mitigates all of their, it mitigates all of their material about people, like who is going to be in activist groups from now on in under outside of the house. That's never going to happen because the same people are still going to be in activist groups that will in it on their side of the house because they have an emotional attachment. We think we get it even better under our side of the house because you no longer have people, as we told you at first, fooling themselves into thinking they're okay. You no longer have people thinking that they got this job, not as a diversity hire, but because they truly deserved it. You have people stepping back and rationally thinking, oh my God, my job is racially discriminating against me. Oh my God, people are discriminating against me because of my class, because of the way I look, all of these things, right? We help people realize that we gain more activists who have even more of an emotional attachment under our side of the house. We think we get the best social justice. Let's move on to our third question, which is kind of a sub part of this, which is women. How do we get the best outcomes for women? Why do we think this is so important in this debate? We think women are a really important minority to focus on in debates like this because they are one of the most affected groups by self-deception, right? We think this comes in two key ways. Firstly, looking at like diet culture and body image. Secondly, looking at the way overconfident men treat women. Let's look at that first, let's look at that first section first. So body image and how that affects women on the outside of the house. I think there are two key ways in which we actually help women. Firstly, in looking at their body in more of a positive light. And secondly, rejecting the views that an unhealthy body is something that you want to be, what you want to have. So why does this happen under their side of the house? We think there are a bunch of diet cultures and beauty industries that are built on tricking women into thinking irrationally about how they look. Think about early 2000s tabloids that would call Paris Hilton fat to trick mid-sized body women into thinking they were obese monsters. We think we get rid of that under our side of the house. We get rid of those negative mental effects that we talked to you about first. We also get women feeling happier, which I explained to you why that's so important. 
important. We also stop people glorifying unhealthy bodies, right? Heroin chic is a real thing which encourages people to do drugs and smoke in order to get the skinniest they can be. If we look at this rationally and we stop deceiving ourselves and thinking that's normal, we get better outcomes, we get healthier women, we get better relationships with our body, we get better mental health, we get better body neutrality, which we think is really important to the feminist movement overall. Lastly, let's look at overconfident men. Firstly, in the workplace, we know that men are more likely to apply for jobs they are less qualified for, whereas women won't apply for jobs they are qualified for unless they are overqualified for it. On the outside of the house, you can look at that more realistically. You get less men applying for jobs because they know they don't actually deserve those jobs, and more women applying for jobs and promotions because they know they do, do deserve those jobs. We think that's super important because obviously the gender pay gap is a huge issue in our society. If we allow people to look rationally at the situation that they're like applying for a job or applying for a promotion, we get the best outcomes. We also think that um, and we'll discuss this more at third, how sexual violence is a huge problem when you when you view yourself as a more powerful person, especially men viewing themselves as the most powerful people in society who deserve sex. Think of incel mass shooters like Elliot Rogers. Because we get better outcomes for women, better social justice, better mental health, we've already won. Thank you. I'd like to thank the second affirmative speaker for that speech and welcome the second negative speaker to continue the debate. For any of the arguments to stand on social justice, the affirmative had to prove that rational thoughts is something that can lead to things like collectivism. That it's rational to believe that you are able to solve climate change when like certain countries and large billion dollar industries that are entrenched into the powers of government are things that would be overthrown by a protest in a different part of the world. They never provided the reason why just thinking rationally will mean that people will think of outcomes that are favorable to them. They had to establish the most rational chain of links were the ones that they were thinking. They never did, those arguments don't stand. I'm gonna do two things in the speech. Firstly, deal with mental health and analyze the stakeholders that were missed by affirmative team. Secondly, deal with social movements. First on mental health, notice that they didn't address the group of people who are in incurable ongoing scenarios. These aren't people who are victims of a crime or who have lost a family member. These are people who are living in Africa that are having 10 children in the hopes that two can survive. These are the people who are working 14 hours a day in the hope that the like next day the weather doesn't ruin their crop and they will starve to death. We think that there's like millions of people, like hundreds of millions of people who live like this throughout the developing world and are in the worst circumstance that we face. They didn't provide anything on this. What we told you is that the, when you think rationally in the way you want to, you feel that your life is worthless. You are not contributing to society, that you should not have a child because that child should die, that you should not bother growing food because you're expected to die in two years in your early 30s. We think the lives for these people are awful. What did we give these people? We gave them a unique way that we can like make these people feel at least some positive experience in their existence. It means that they're likely to be able to rationalize that maybe this religious group that is like pro proselytizing in the area, I don't know the world, is like something more valuable than anything else and can feel a sense of community and a sense of worth. It means that they're more likely to buy into things like family is what's most important because they are able to overcome the rational barrier that there's all these structural hardships. We went in that mental health argument because we this is a group that is like so large and we get such a huge impact from literally the worst successes of life to at least being somewhat comfortable in the way they live. Let's talk about the people that AF wanted to talk about, which were the people who self-deceive themselves into a way of depression. I want to make uh, like four observations. The first is to say that when you rationally think, a lot of the mental health things are extremely awful. For example, the statistics on therapy working is something that is somewhat positive for like the like least mentally ill people. But for people who have gone through the worst forms of trauma, like, like uh, victims of serious crimes, like they have something chronic that they were born with, therapy is something that at most will give you a tangible, like small tangible change, but ruin your bank account. So I think that when you're a rational person deciding to go into therapy or not, you look at that data and you decide it's something that you don't want to do. So even if AF has proved that when you are in that therapy, that therapy process is better, so many people won't enter that therapy. Second observation is that data and statistical distrust in therapy is massively exacerbated when you look at the statistics of like minorities and the way that they are just dicked over by the medical system. When they look at that data and they think rationally, they will think there's a higher chance that I will be abused and my problems will be ignored and I would have wasted $100 than I will feel any better better walking out and they would not enter. We needed that positive rehabilitation, that I am special, that I am someone unique. 
Third and final thing to say is, especially drugs like antidepressants carry a lot of risks, but, and people like, we need people to be able to like, focus on the fact that that risk won't hit me so that they're able to take a drug that can massively help them. Final thing to say is they challenge us by saying therapy is just about rationalizing thoughts, but no, it's not. It's also an emotive process. It's understanding and being able to like respond to emotive language to feel sensations. It's being able to respond to anecdotal stories of this is how someone went through something and this is how you can too. Instead of rationally blocking that story by saying that, oh, the scenarios are different. You believe that there is hope. That ability to believe in hope is what breaks the barrier that locks yourself into a place that like doesn't exist. Uh, we think that in that case, even if they are able to get better mental health treatment for people who have self-deceived themselves and to be mentally ill, we were the side that helped people with trauma fight to overcome the statistical odds. We would much rather help them because we think both worlds therapy for those less mentally ill people we are kept off. In terms of general more mental health things, which was what came out more at first, which is things like you'll bring down and spiral because you think that you are stupid. If you think rationally, there are like, a spectrum of people who are good at certain things in the world. Essentially what you're saying is if you think rationally, that if you're in like the bottom 30%, you are going to be the person that becomes mentally ill because uh, you are like, will not care about participation award when you're getting a C and your friend is getting a HD. We think that all the stress and anxiety you feel are like guaranteed things to occur to that like bottom 30 to 40% of people. The comparative on our world for that stress is people are much more likely to buy into narratives that they are like the main character and be more responsive to things. Like the reason being, first of all, your subconscious buying as being like the only person you can see and feel and understand. You naturally and instinctively think that you are someone who is special. So when you have things like bad grades, you are less likely to be a mood because you can rationalize thoughts that maybe it's not my fault. Maybe it was the bad day I was having. It's because your family, like it's, most family structures are the ones that love and respect and make you feel so valued. The third is like things like participation awards. We were the side that for that bottom 30% of people who was like not objectively special, they weren't left out. They didn't spiral. But in our world, we have like a much, much more people will not spiral because they feel that they are the main character and will instead have the positive self-perception. And that onto uh, social movements, w the problem was they never proved to you that these were rational things. For example, if you like the environmental movement I gave you, that the government lobbying, that China and North Korea, you can have any impact on them, which means none of the things that they stood stand. But let's say that they didn't. The other, let's talk about the group they talked about, particularly feminism. They gave us two really needed examples. For example, if you're a woman who can't get a job, but they never explain to you why you enter into a social movement. You enter into a social movement because you realize the sufferings that you are going through are not caused by you. The, the patriarchy is what's bringing you down, not your capabilities as a woman. That's the access for you to want to go out and protest and riot. So we think that when we get that group of women to be even more angry, to see that, yeah, actually, it's not just me. Look how bad the patriarchy is and seeing even worse than it actually is. You're much more likely to get that group to buy in. And when they buy in, they're going to do things like risk their lives more violently for a protest, more people willing to go out for a protest, because those are things that require self-sacrifice. And if you don't truly believe in that cause that you are doing through that negative perception of how bad it is, you would not be as angry. You would not fight as hard because the rational thought is if I go to this protest, I'll waste my time. I'll lose my job. Uh, I could get like bad reputation. I could be abused by the police. You need to overcome that rationality by that negative perception of being angry and the positive perception that we are actually able to achieve change in a world that's structurally against change. The only, the comment that they made on this was, no, you need like the group of people to realize that they are mistreated. I think I'm perfectly happy to accept that some women will have like not believe that they are being mistreated because instead we get the much bigger group, which is the women who are actually suffering at their worst, being angrier and fighting harder. We are much happier to take an angrier group of people than a, a group of people who would be less active. The reason we win this debate is they never proved that rational thoughts are things that are going to lead to the outcomes we wanted. We got mental people with mental illnesses to want to seek therapy. We got like the like people who aren't talented a reason to keep on fighting and we got social movements to change they wanted. Proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the second negative speaker for that speech and welcome the third affirmative speaker to conclude the affirmative team's case. 
side affirmatives still stood for a world where you could have anger, you could have hope, you could make value judgments. What we didn't stand for was a world where you located those value judgments in and of yourself and you allowed facts about the outside world to radically shape your own self perception in a way that meant that you could no longer coexist reasonably with the world around you. I think this occurs, as Bronwyn tells you right from the start of the debate, on a huge variety of, spe of uh, on a huge spectrum and in many different ways. So in the first part of this speech, I want to focus on the ways that this sort of self-talk and personal perception affects different groups of people. Firstly, I want to reiterate the mechanism that Brahma brings you, which is that the reason why this way of thinking is so pernicious is because it feeds itself. It spirals out of control very rapidly because of the confirmation bias that it eventuates. What does this mean? It means when you start thinking, God, I'm so shit at life, everything you do that could possibly be interpreted to confirm that belief in your mind feeds into it and makes it even larger. We think this is a pretty clear mechanism that a lot of serious mental health conditions eventuate from. But this is true even for people who don't have, for example, serious or diagnosed mental health conditions. It's just true for people who are trying to cope with all of the myriad pressures that society puts onto them. This is people trying to cope with body image who have to tell themselves, no, it's fine, I look really hot, I look really hot. And then as soon as you see an unflattering photo of yourself, your self-perception crumbles into dust. We think the mechanism that is so specifically pernicious is this oscillation between extremes. That's what meant that people couldn't think about their lives, think, set realistic goals, achieve them or not. It meant that they were constantly either chasing this idea of perfection or stuck in the depths of self-hatred. What's important about this point is that we didn't get benefits only for people who had pre-existing mental illness, though certainly we get benefits for them as well. We think we divert a lot of people from mental health issues, but also we just allow people to sort of live their lives without having to constantly fear failure or strive endlessly for unrealistic success. That was a huge win in this debate that applied to a wide, wide variety of people um, and we think is a significant benefit that we claim. What Travis tells you is that they would prefer a world in which people think that they are the main character. What we tell you in response to that is that firstly, a lot of this idea of being the main character often requires fitting very specific standards of being a cool girl, what you should look like, what kind of TikTok trends you need to be all over in order to fulfill this stereotype. We much prefer a world where people have empathy for others because they're not putting themselves in, in an unrealistic and unsubstantiated relation to the people around them by thinking that they're either better than or not worthy of those other individuals. That was how we thought we had more productive interpersonal relationships if you weren't constantly comparing yourself on a very unreliable metric. So now I want to go through this in a few more specific cases. I'm going to split this up into three different kinds of people. The first are people who have a genuine need to avoid trauma. So this includes people in painful emotional states. For example, somebody who, um, you know, a young widow who is grieving the loss of their partner and who is facing a genuinely terrible life event. It's important to note here that we didn't you know, waltz into this debate and claim that everyone is going to be, you know, reasonable and reasonably happy all of the time. Of course, you're going to have periods of intense feelings of grief. What we think we avoided, though, was feeling that I will never be loved again. This is somehow a personal failing of me. I should have done more. I'm unworthy of happiness. It didn't, it didn't mean that you got to say to yourself, everything will be okay you know, I'm going to marry on, go through my life. That wasn't what we were claiming, but we still think you get a huge benefit in allowing these people to face reality and trying to distance some of the value judgments from things that are personally about themselves. That was a huge benefit in this debate. We don't think that they addressed how they get this. They tell us, ah, but you know, people will go to therapy because they'll know how depressed they are because they'll feel so terrible about themselves. We think it's a much better mechanism for the vast majority of people in society Society, that they just avoid those terrible thoughts about themselves in the first place. The next and the most convincing um, material that we hear from Team Negative is for people who are, live in genuinely terrible states 
in the world. We concede that this is a group of people who it's not going to be much help for them to look at the objective facts of their life if the objective facts of their life are terrible. However, it is important to be comparative on this point because the benefit we think is relatively marginal to being able to delude yourself that um, you know, there's going to be some kind of Hail Mary event in your life or that things are going to magically get better. I reiterate, the benefit that we do give to those people is that they can distance the facts of their life from value judgments about themselves as individuals. But importantly, the key mechanism that they claim here is this element of hope. We think that you can still have hope while acknowledging that, the, that your life and the situations in which you live are objectively terrible. You can hope that things will get better. The particular mechanism that we displace, though, is this idea that, you know, people in wealthy countries can get off on the suffering of the poor, that, you know, everyone's just dying to feel something. So you think, oh, God, you know, those poor suffering people without doing anything actually substantive to fix it. I think a really major problem for these people living in genuinely terrible states of the world is that everyone else is happy to, you know, dissociate from that and to accept that this is business as normal. Certainly, we, we do not stand for that world. Yes, it is a terrible thing to confront the realities of a world that is unfair and that is unkind. However, we cannot see how side negative does anything to ameliorate that situation. The self-delusional guilt is in fact harmful if it stops people from taking tangible steps to improve their lives even in some small way. And that brings me to the last group of stakeholders who I want to analyze under this point, which are people in mainstream society who do genuinely want to help others. Uh, this is separate to the social movements, which I'll deal with quickly in a moment. Most people overestimate how much they individually can do. No, we're not going to fix climate change by using our keep cups and reusable straws. But on the flip side of that, people also underestimate how much they can do. It's not true that we have nothing to offer the best way to actually help people in desperate situations and to make a real difference to the world is to do the things that are within your power. Not to get old Peter Singer, because obviously I do not like him, but genuinely making modest donations to a charity that you care about that aligns with your values would be a fantastic way for us to drag a whole heap of people out of abject poverty. That's something that is entirely consistent with the mechanisms that we've provided on our side of the house. Very quickly on social movements. People who were at extremes who had lived experiences of oppression would have that objective basis for anger and for movement anyway. The people who we were able to access in this debate were those who thought that their successes in society were because of their own merit and therefore they didn't need feminism at you, Bronwyn Bishop. What we got though was for those people to be able to acknowledge that the reality of their life, that some of their success was their own, but also that the systemic structures that surrounded them were highly indicative of the kind of lives that they were able to live. That was the mechanism by which we mobilise the middle and we think we also win social movements too. So proud to affirm. I'd like to thank the third affirmative speaker for concluding the affirmative team's case and welcome the third negative speaker to conclude the negative team's case and the debate.